and welcome to this episode of Data Center Minute. Today I'm here with Rhonda Acerto, and she is Vice President of Research at Uptime Institute. And also joining us is Andy Lawrence, the Executive Director of Research for Uptime Institute. So welcome to the show today, both of you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having us. Um, Andy, if you'd like to get started, uh, could you tell me uh, a little bit about um, the five trends that Uptime Institute identified for 2021 in their most recent report? Sure, thank you. Um, well, first of all, why did we do this? And I think there's a kind of a slightly silly reason is that at the end of every year, everybody starts asking what are the big trends for, for next year? And we obviously get asked this at Uptime Institute a lot. Um, in previous years, we've actually done 10, um, and that seemed like a lot, especially when we're trying to develop a good position on all of them. And especially as the, the industry, frankly, doesn't change that much. So you find yourself re repeating the same thing year over year. So this year we did give it quite a lot of thought and we, we, we went down to five and we really tried to say some things that we think not everybody else will be saying. Some of them other people will be saying, but also things that we really think it's worth bringing people's attention to. Something is gonna change. So we, we spent a lot of time talking internally and, and a few people externally and we came up with this list which is uh number one uh, a big increase we think is coming in terms of accountability the accountability imperative um in terms of resiliency and how you run your operations in particular with regard to reliability um secondly and not disconnected with covid um we expect there to be an increase in automation uh, thirdly, everyone's talking about the edge. And so we felt it was important we had something to say about this. We don't necessarily see a dramatic increase in the rollout, but um, Rhonda's going to talk about this. But we, we do see an increase in activity that Rhonda will talk about and why that's important. Sustainability, number four. Um, sustainability has been with us as a topic for at least 10 years. Uh, in the data center area, probably about 12 years, I think it's really been an issue. Um, what we expect to see now is a really a, an upscaling and an increase in the seriousness of how that is applied and how people have to follow it. And I think a lot of operators are going to be in for a bit of a shock about just how much they're going to have to pay attention to that, this issue. And finally, innovation. We've been tracking innovations coming down the pipe, and there are just some that are coming through now that are really quite interesting. It's been talked, again, have been talked about for a while, but we're starting to see them being applied. So we can get into that. Uh, so I, I like one of the, the points that you bring up here. Well, I like a few of them, but um, we're going to start with this one. So. So accountability you refer to as, as a new imperative in the report, but um, it really shouldn't be a new concept. So, so can you talk about what you think has led to a lack of accountability in the years past and, and what you think is going to change as we overcome that hurdle this year and into the future? Right. Well, I'm not sure it's going to change dramatically immediately, but it's changing. Um, so as you say, it shouldn't be new and it isn't new. I mean, if you're running your IT or you're running your data center, you are absolutely accountable to your management and your clients. So not, nothing's changed there. It's a very, very serious matter. Uh, and people put a lot of effort into making sure that data centers stay up. Um, and they put a lot into the IT that sits in the data centers to make sure they don't fail. Um, but what has happened is that the level of outsourcing in recent years has, and, and towards the cloud and to colas, but particularly to cloud, has been so fast, so great, uh, and it's often not been done in a fully thoughtful way. And so we have started to see 
quite a lot of serious situations arising where cloud services have gone down and that's not a criticism necessarily of them but uh they go down like everything else does and then the business loses um you know that they, they can't function either because they've lost key applications or ac access to key data uh, and then they lose money and they lose reputation and they run into client compliance issues and what do they get back from the cloud providers well they get a credit note basically and an apology so you know one of the things we're seeing i'll take the banking sector as an example every single bank we talk to wants to use cloud more they want to use public cloud services more and every single one of them is worried that the compliance and regulation laws that apply to them, they can't get their key suppliers, cloud providers, to sign up to. So there's a big problem. And they, at some point, the cloud providers are going to go, this business is too big for us not to, to play with these finance companies. Um, and, and so we will see that a lot of these compliance type requirements start to pass across the ecosystem and i think once it happens in one sector it will happen in all others and it and and so it should because it's it's not right that somebody could be losing millions of dollars a minute um and and their key people responsible have no um no accountability if there's a problem yeah it's a it's an interesting situation there you know because it's it's like who is, who is responsible ultimately um so it's hard responsibility to take on but um but i definitely see i see that change coming in the future too and um and i think it will be interesting so uh rhonda what do you think we can expect to see regarding the workforce and um, efficiency gains as a result of smarter darker data centers so it's a great question and I'm I'm actually asked it quite a lot and I invariably end up disappointing everybody with my answer. <laughs> um, you know, I've spent a number of years working with data center operators and owners on choosing and strategizing and, and implementing remote technologies. And I'm just talking about, you know, big data centers. I'm not talking about um, small lights out edge facilities because that's that's um, you know they're designed from the get go to be highly automated remote dark and smart um, and you know there's often a huge appetite to you know implement more intelligence more data driven approaches and certainly more automation in data centers and COVID absolutely has pushed that to the fore you know with remote working and limited access to facilities. So we're just seeing an explosion in interest around this. But what we always find, and you know, is that this is not just a technology play, right? The biggest, in my experience, the biggest barrier to gaining greater efficiencies and to easing workforce requirements um, is the organizational change that you need to be able to implement the technologies. So, you know, it's not straightforward. It's, it's not a technological, a technological challenge. Um, I do believe that piece has largely been solved, but it is quite complex. And unless it's a brand new facility, um, you know, you can be sure that implementing remote technologies, is, it's gonna be iterative, you know, particularly if it's an AI driven approach, which one can reasonably expect it would be. Um, and also, you know, being able to, it's going to be iterative, which is slow and time consuming. And it requires a lot of training of the staff to, um, you know, use the software. Uh, and then most of all, it's recasting or even recreating operational processes and procedures so that the data from the technology can be, you know, exploited. So you can be more efficient and so you can have fewer people on site. And it's just a long, slow process and it's generally iterative. So it's not a one and done project putting in remote technologies. Um, it's very much an ongoing process um, and it takes a lot of time and you know, a, quite a high level of monetary commitment outside of the cost of the technology. So I'm not expecting to see huge gains immediately because it's just going to take time to get this technology in place um, to be able to get those end goals achieved. It's definitely happening. We're on the way, but um, for most data centers, it's still you know early to mid stages. So, so not um, much yet. <laughs> so I have just sort of a curiosity question here, but 
I, I used to work in hotels and um, at my, at one of the hotels that I worked at, we had a computer system and I knew that it had a name. I knew the name of this computer. It was the income. And that's about all I knew about it. So, um, so what the computer did is it automated everything. It was connected to sensors in the rooms. It told us when people were in the room, when they were out of the room, what they had their therm thermostat set at. And, you know, it had a range that it could drop when they were out of the room. Um, and it would tell us if the PTAC units, like even if it was hitting the target temperature, if it had to work harder to get there so that we could find that it had a problem ahead of time, um, did all these really cool things. And for years, I never knew that. So, so, you know, one day I was like, this is taking up all this space. I want to get rid of it. And someone said, you can't. And I said, why? We don't use it. So I had the company come out and teach me how to use it. And, you know, that's how I learned about it. And I, and I started implementing it and the maintenance guy would use it for his work orders, but, um, but it didn't do us any good for so many years, you know, and we put all, all of that time and effort into it. So I'm just wondering if, in the data center industry, do you see that? Do you pe see people where they're putting the technology in because it sounds good, um, and then they're just not using it, though? Absolutely, but more so in the past. So, um, and really, what we're talking about here, you know, whether or not you want to call it this, we're ultimately talking about DSIM as a foundational layer here, right? It's aggregating a lot of data from a lot of different sources and normalizing it and then analyzing it, right? So, you know, we've all know that DSIM has been a four letter word for many years in this sector, right? And it's, you know, to your point, it's not the technology, it's just, uh, you know, it's not a simple thing to replace existing well-worn, you know, very, you know, physics-based processes and procedures, um, you know, with a software data-driven approach. It's it just takes time. And yes, absolutely. We used to hear about that a lot where people would uh, buy the software, start to put it in. It would be a huge headache. No one would use it. They would spend more time trying to change the organization, you know, with the, the facilities uh, teams to use the software than they would actually having any benefits from it. Um, but since then, you know, the technology's really come a long way. It's much more easy to implement now. It's far more user intuitive. And I think that the greater use of AI um, is helping um, tremendously to get past some of those, you know, sticky points with, with implementing. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think that, that that has certainly been something that's dogged this type of technology, but I'm hopeful, and especially COVID uh, really giving the, you know, the C-suite good reason to release budget for this type of investment. Um, I'm hopeful that, um, you know, that sort of issue is a thing of the past, but it's not, it's going to depend really on the organizational maturity of the facilities operations um, and also their maturity around implementing software and using it and relying on it too. You know, yeah. we have lots of automation in data centers. They're highly automated environments, but it's slightly different when you're taking all this disparate data, particularly you've got you've got some sort of you know machine learning algorithm behind it that's a bit of a blank box uh, to trust it and to be able to use it in a way that yeah delivers measurable benefits. Hmm. But, um, people who do that, people who do and who are successful with it uh, and stick it out, you know, they they say nothing short than it revolutionizes their operations. So I'm hopeful that uh, this is something that we we will see much more of in the next year or two. Yeah, if, if I could chip in, um, we used to we we used to see people buying DSIM and they didn't leave anything left in their budget to implement it. And okay. So the suppliers used to say, it's not our fault. The technology works. It's not our fault that it's sitting there on the shelf. They haven't trained anyone to use it. They don't they wouldn't change their processes. Um, and the, the buyers now have got so much smarter. And they, they, you know, we, we advise, Rhonda knows the exact more about it than I do, but we advise somewhere around 50% needs to be kept back for training and implementation and process change. Um, yeah, I go as far to say the cost of the software, you need to, that's the, you need to put the same amount aside just to implement it, you know, just to get it up and running. So, yeah, because it doesn't do everything for you. <laughs> Just the tech, it's just the software. It's not actually going to hit the switch or change the, you know, the set point for you. You need to help train it. You need to be sure that it's behaving in a way that, you know, you want it to and, you know, to do the things you want it to do. So 
Yeah. Although in your hotel, it sounds like it did do most things. Yeah. It did, and it, you know, and it was really cool once I learned about it. Um, yeah. But yeah, just you know, for a long time, nobody, <laughs> nobody knew what the computer was sitting there. So, um, so then uh, you know, obviously, edge is a popular topic. Um, we could talk about it forever, but we're not going to. So um, I'm going to narrow the focus a little bit, Rhonda, and just ask you. Which industries do you think should lead the way to edge, uh, so to speak, and and why those industries? Sure thing, and, and you're right. You know that's the problem with the edge. We could talk about it forever, right? It's not <laughs> a lot. Of, you know, it's it's, and and the build out of the edge is going to be uneven, right? You know, that's because at the end of the day, there is not just one type of edge workload, right? So those that have you know strong latency and or bandwidth and or resiliency requirement uh, to have. Um, you know, net new edge computing, because edge is also nothing new in unto itself, right? Where we're seeing the most action in terms of industries, that is by, you know, for demand is, um, I would say retail, because of their distributed environments, the financial sector for similar reasons, um, and manufacturing. Uh, and that has largely been driven by IoT. Um, but, you know, whether or not we're going to see huge demand from any of those sectors or noticeably huge uplift in demand from any of those sectors this year, um, it's really uncertain. Um, what I do think we can expect to see where we can see a lot of action, we are expecting to see a lot of action next year, um, is with the build out and the players that I see, um, you know, garnering a lot of investment and, you know, taking a lot of action. Um, you know, there are sort of three main areas. One's telcos, right? They've always been doing edge, um, but we expect they're gonna be investing in a lot more because they're turning into bandwidth carriers, right? And they're also turning into extenders of the internet with new exchange points, right? I think the cloud is gonna play an increasingly large role. And, you know, when I hold my breath, it's around cloud for the edge because I think today we don't yet fully understand what their big moves are gonna be. It's, demand's not there yet to justify necessarily a huge level of investment, but we're already seeing uh, products, you know, that enable, you know, you to run your cloud or your cloud tooling environment on-prem, be it in a colo or an enterprise with things like AWS Outpost and Google Anthos and Azure Arc and so on. And I really see those as edge plays, right? Um, they're also the clouds and the third big, um, you know, I think movers and shakers for 2021 are gonna continue to be the colos, right? So they're really enabling the regional edge with more and more interconnections and by creating more software to find, you know, wide area networks. And so they're enabling, you know, clouds, enterprises, partners, customers to create new exchanges and interconnections of data and, um, and, and workloads, um, you know, in, in, in many different distributed locations. And for sure, we're gonna see more and more and more of that. And I think you're gonna see the clouds and the telcos both playing a bigger role inside of colos to enable that so um and then that sort of is a segue into our our next topic here which is uh sustainability another thing that we could talk about forever so um and and kind of like edge this one's tough too because it means different things to different people so you know you can't just say uh, this is how you're sustainable, or you know, this is this is an edge facility or something. It's different depending on the application. Um, but but Andy, what measures do you feel that every data center should be implementing um, to to be on that path to sustainability that we need to be on? Hmm. Well, I mean, just to put it into context, the reason why we chose it this year because you are right we could talk about it forever and it has been around for quite a bit is it, i think this is going to be a really important year across the world i mean we obviously in the us we've got the change of government and and whether it's going to be a focus on sustainability that you've probably not seen in the us up to now um the european which europeans have always been generally more serious about climate change are stepping up and they are planning to, to introduce quite a lot of measures and actions that are specifically around data centers. Um, and also um, there's a widespread move in the industry, in all industries indeed, to adopt science-based targets where, where you agree a clear uh, target to reduce 
energy and carbon emissions in your sector. And many companies now are adopting this and many, many more will. Uh, and including most of the major players in our sector, in the ICT sector. And one of the aspects of that is that, is that these companies are committing to reducing carbon emissions across um, not only direct uh, energy uh, carbon emissions, say through diesel, but through purchased electricity and through Im embedded emissions. Well, this is a way of background for saying it's going to get a lot more serious. And the one thing everybody, I think, should do, and it's not technology, again, it's appoint somebody, give them the authority and have a strategy and, and have a buy-in because it's, it, it will come anyway. So get ahead of it. There's going to be a lot of... Um, kind of dull reporting work, measuring work, uh, working with partners through the supply chain, etc. And so I think the best thing organizations need to do is get ahead of that and get on top of the process because it's going to be important. Uh, I think I think that's really good advice. And, you know, one thing I've noticed is when we have sort of new thing, I say new things, even though sustainability isn't a new thing, but um, these new things that kind of pop up where um, you don't always know if it's going to be a full-time job or it doesn't necessarily start out as a full-time job to begin with. So, so it's kind of like, oh, hey, you know, you take on, on these sustainability initiatives and you do this, and but everybody has their regular job and that is their priority. Right. And so then when these extra things come up, it's always those extra things that get that get pushed off to the side because you feel like it doesn't matter if you don't do them because the day is still going to go on if you don't spend some time researching sustainability. Right. Um, and, so I um, think that that's some really smart advice to just tell people yeah. if you have a person and then that's all that they're responsible for doing and you don't give them the work of the other people and the other departments because they don't have a, you know, full workload yet, you let them build it up. Um, I think that's that's really interesting. And, and you know, it's not, again, rather like the, the resiliency, it's not something that you can really outsource. I think there has been an attitude in the industry that, oh, we can, um, we, we, we'll, we'll get our energy supplier to supply us with green energy, inverted commas. So, you know, we, we've solved the problem and then they can put on their marketing material that we're a green data center and it that isn't going to work anymore that is absolutely not going to work when microsoft or google says we will not put our workload in your data center until you can prove to us with paperwork with measurements that you are doing x y and z that's going to that's going to wake a few people up yeah definitely um so on that same topic here uh, th through your experience over the years, what is the most innovative sustainability strategy you've heard of, whether it has actually been implemented or not, just uh, just overall strategy? Um, what's what's the most innovative? Yeah, so we <laughs> we were discussing this earlier, and you know there have been data centers that are you know one hundred percent powered on site by you know solar panels or um biomass or or whatever um and it's but it's not that it's not technology i think the thing that's probably most impressed me has and it, it sounds sounds so dull but <laughs> when companies do things like introduce a carbon budget um where you know for example microsoft which did this 10 years ago but it's, it's taken them a while to really fully roll it out but it's probably been the most effective thing. Suddenly, you know, well, not suddenly, but ev every individual is measured and every department has a carbon budget. And that is a lever by which that uh, department is, is, in effect, has to produce data that it has to live up to and aspirations and goals. And that, in turn, drives behavior, whether it's travel, the use of alternative energy, 
uh, the use of reclaimed energy, the reporting of, of uh, carbon emissions or, or, or other things. So I think it's, it's things like that, making it really real and then investing in all of the um, analytics ac across the company to make sure that people are aware and that, that's very powerful. Yeah, I agree with that because I think a lot of times, um, especially as just an individual, because um, because that's a cool approach because you're reaching the workers that way, you know, they kind of, it's, it's not just something that the company is focused on that doesn't matter to the employees, it's, it's incorporating them. And so I feel that um, embodied carbon was not something that I ever thought of before I worked here, but I mean, it, it's important and I feel like sometimes we're fighting ourselves, right? We think that we're doing something that's good, only we don't really know the back end process of it. So we don't really know that this one was better than the other. And 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 I hope that this is a year that more people learn about that. So um, something I wanna hear from both of you is just, uh, what are you most excited for in 2021 in terms of whether it is new technologies or just um, new strategies that you think the industry is going to adopt? Uh, you know, any topic, it could be anything. So whoever wants to start, you can start and and we'll see what it is. Well, I'm, I'm most excited about being allowed to visit a data center again. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I think, and I'm probably speaking for Rhonda as well, it, the, the technology does excite me. It, it does interest me. You know, when there's new technologies coming out, we we do like to track these very closely. So, even though I think it's probably early days for some of the technologies we've spoken about, still, um, things like silicon photonics, where you're starting to see, f um, you know, the, the the fiber optic connectivity going right inside the circuit, right onto the um, uh, into the electronics, which can really reduce um, latency and will enable a lot more flexibility in the way that uh, data centers are laid out and designed. Uh, that, that, that's really, to me, quite exciting because you could start to see significant jumps in uh, density, efficiency, computing, um, more flexibility in design, all stemming from quite specific basic level technology changes. That's just one example. There are a few that are falling into that category that have been sort of rumbling out of the labs for a while. And so it's, I think it is technology that excites me, even though at the end of the day, it, it is about operational uh, execution and strategy that makes a difference. And uh, what about you, Rhonda? Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, I am looking forward to getting back in another data center, but I'm also quite excited at being at a dinner party, but maybe saying people around the table might actually know what a data center is after COVID. I'm wondering, I'm quite excited about testing that because sure. uh, I think it really has raised the profile of digital infrastructure. You know, everything has, you know, I, 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 I'm wondering, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to, 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 to test that theory. Um, but I the, absolutely agree with Andy 100%. It's the technology that, you know, I'm always looking forward to. And I think to build on what Andy said about, you know, silicon photonics, nothing new, right? Software defined power is a particular area. Again, it's nothing new. I um, mean, there are many ways it can be implemented. It's, it involves several technologies, but I really think we're ripe as an industry to be able to start treating power like an on-demand resource and as a resource that can be exploited, um, be provisioned for one thing um, and exploited for, for many, um, you know, particularly around energy storage. I'm really excited to dig in this year into some of the new areas of development in energy storage, um, because I think once that is a situation, once, once, once the energy storage cost uh, issue is solved and capacity issue is solved, I think it really opens up a whole world of software defined powered strategies for more and more data centers. I think it will help more data centers in the sector as a whole to be able to operate more environmentally sustainable as well. So I've got a particular eye on energy storage and also artificial intelligence. Again, nothing new, but I'm so excited about in the so-called democratization of AI thanks to you know, our big cloud uh, constituents who, 
you know, really making AI as a service. And now we have DSIM as a service and DSIM AI and data center AI as a service, you know, relatively readily available. So I'm excited about where that's going to take us beyond what we're already using AI for, particularly around things like uh, risk mitigation and projection of risk and modeling risk and modeling costs um, and so forth. So those are my two big areas, energy storage and AI. Um, I don't know if I should tell you guys this or not. Um, you'll either be really excited or you'll be really jealous, but I started out my 2021 by going on a tour of four data centers. So oh, really? I stepped foot in the, in the white space this year already. So um, I don't know I, if that gives you hope or makes you jealous, like I said, but, but there it is. And, uh, and it was really exciting and, and I had oh, a great time. So congratulations. I'll be sharing some information about that tour uh, shortly. So you guys, I think that um, you answered all the questions that I had for you. I, I think it's it's an interesting thing that you do. Um, and, and I appreciate your insight into the future. I know that you can't be, you, you can't be too uh, probably confident about these predictions after making predictions for 2020 and seeing, you know, how that year went. But, but I think that's kind of the exciting part about the industry is that everything's yeah. changing so much. So um, these things that you talk about are definitely going to happen. It's just, are they going to happen the way that we thought that they were going to? So, uh, so it'll be exciting to circle back around next year and, and see. Um, but thank you for joining me on the show today. I appreciate your time so much, both of you, Andy and Brenda. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, pleasure. And uh, for everybody watching, tune in next time to another episode of Data Center Minute.